next up will be uh, Francois Le Goff. Um, both speakers have actually circulated their CVs, so I don't intend to read them out extant, but I'll just pick out a couple of important points. One is she must have been through so many passports because um, Francoise claims she's visited 145 countries in her work over the years, mainly for the Red Cross, where she's done nearly four decades uh, service with them all over the place and currently at the uh, World Headquarters in Geneva. Um, currently, I think you hold the title, Francoise, of uh, Director of Global Services uh, Centre in, in Hungary. I don't know if that's a, an adjunct to your job or a second job. Uh, maybe like a, a you may be like a British politician, George Osborne, who seems to have about eight jobs. Um, but there we are. Um, Francoise um, encountered the faith in Zimbabwe in uh, 2007, which I, I can calculate as about 14 years ago. Um, I did ask, ask her for something that would tell us a little bit more about herself outside of the CV, which also includes the interesting fact that she is um, the mother of, of two Kenyan adopted children. Um, I did find out today she actually does that as a single mum, which, given her itinerary, sounds extraordinary. Um, she's also, in her time, done a parachute jump, apparently successfully. Uh, and when she was a, a young girl, she uh, managed to get herself on a bus all the way across South America on her own. Not literally. There was a driver, some passengers, but she was travelling alone. Uh, so there's a bit of a flavour of, of Francoise, who's giving us a fantastic view of her home back in Brittany. Uh, so I'll pass over to you now, Francoise, and I think you would like to share your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, dear friend. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you today and also to take up this challenge of talking on a subject which is uh, uh, not something that I'm used to, even if coming from the humanitarian sector, uh, the topic of debt forgiveness was always uh, an issue and something that um, was interesting in the in, in in the best way to help people recovering from disaster or from uh, social uh, difficulties. So that topic was uh, in fact very interesting for me to to work on. Uh, I got the support from Gary Rush. Thank you very much, Gary, to really uh, get input, compare our views, and try to present something to you. Um, about this topic. Well, I started to look at some historical perspective to put everybody on the on the same line. And um, uh, if we go back really in the beginning of the uh, previous centuries in 1913, <clears throat> um, where private bankers, businessmen created Federal Reserve, uh, kind of central bank, which we have in, in most of the country. Uh, this is, well, it was not a government institution. And uh, at that time, government were printing money uh, to do some profit uh, also and to, to make things running. And private banks uh, had the majority of the money and it was through loans. And when we talk loans, it's in a way debt and debt is the same as money. So it was uh, really um, uh, de facto uh, a system where we, 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 we use, uh, I'm sorry, I am a little bit missing up my, my, my notes here. So um, Bank also use consumer deposit to make profit, which is legally uh, owned. And this can be called like the time of a type of gambling, especially when it concerns uh, derivatives, which are not always transparent in tr instrument that uh, we have seen almost destroy the banking system in 2008. But after the World War II, uh, the in, an international agreement established uh, the Bretton Woods system of monetary management. And uh, this is, uh, uh, it, 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 it established an interconnected global financial system. So up to until 1971, the US dollar was convertible to gold. But after 1971, it was not anymore linked to, to gold and became a free floating, 
then something happened and it is um, the financial crisis. But that came because financial institution were, were said to be too big to fail and they were backed up by central bank which can uh, issue the, the loan. But when there is a, a drastic event, a crash, uh, the whole system collapsed. And we have seen that when this risk of failure, it's all out of control. We have also a number of uh, story where there were corruption and we have, I, I would not go back to the story of this crash, but it spread all over the world quite quickly. Uh, and still now we have some impact on the worker and economy. So when we look at specifically the, the words of this presentation, which is hyper financialization, debt and debt forgiveness, try to look at what we talk with with this um, uh, what when with this global financial system and banking. Um, we 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 know and we have seen how it is independent in all the world. You can see here, for example, uh, that when the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 happened, uh, it started in US and this crash had a domino effect worldwide. And we can see from this uh, diagram, the balance sheet, and you can imagine from uh, uh, one day to another what's happened. In order to prevent a worse collapse, uh, then the government had to intervene. It's what we call the quantitative easing, so that they had to really uh, help to save uh, the banks, uh, which has an impact on pension corporation that own all the securities uh, were uh, affected. So then. The money, the government intervened, tried to help and save um, many banks uh, because only the central banks in many countries were able to do so and to, to, to buy, uh, to bail out this bank and uh, bring some money. And in the end, it, it, uh, we know that this has to pay back, but the question is always by who, and usually it is a taxpayer. So the whole system of this interconnectedness and integration of the world economy has created links that will have uh, or have uh, a, a huge eff uh, effect as a domino. Now, looking into the depth of how the banks uh, are, uh, as a state, have huge depths, and we can see again here uh, on the diagram how it fall very quickly. And usually states are using either they raise taxes or they cut spending as a way to uh, address this debt. Uh, but we know that the uh, country ability to cover all uh, does not always exist. And we have seen some countries, uh, Greece or Argentina, where we had a, a default and then it had huge economic consequences. And when we have uh, huge debt, it means that the money by the government are not used for other uh, priority. And usually it is education, health, or other uh, system like that. <clears throat> if we look at the example of the COVID crisis that uh, we are all facing, this major event, uh, who in less than one year, we see uh, 120 million people uh, infected, 2.6 million deaths. We are reaching with this economy, uh, the same figures that we had in 1917, uh, 1918 during the uh, flu uh, uh, in that period, who in total over the three years of the epidemic killed nearly 6 million people. So here in one year, we had 2.6 people uh, <clears throat> affected. So what, what is the impact on the economical uh, side is that since 2008, um, in fact, the whole world economic were in a recovery mode, 
after the, the crisis. And even these growths were slowly coming back, uh, but still weak. And so when the crisis, the COVID crisis uh, reached us, it has uh, an immediate effect because it was quite, quite rapid. So again, we have seen intervention from government uh, to try to save a number of economical uh, situation. It is really uneven in the world, which means some countries have suffered uh, more than, than others. And um, so what we know from the north of the world is that uh, suddenly airline could not function, tourism has been cut off and usually it affects a thousand country, not only, but many, many countries in the south, the whole cultural sector was affected. So we, if we look at uh, the education system, university, so it, it is really touching every corner of the whole economy. Um, because of government intervention, uh, in, in some countries, employment was maintained to a rate which was acceptable. It's not the case in some southern country or when country, uh, when government cannot intervene in the same way. But we, we believe that the, the medium and long term effect on employment will be severe also. To a certain extent, a positive uh, element is that the savings in many countries, people were not able to spend their money, so they have saved money. And uh, in France, for example, the, the, the savings has uh, is, uh, is reached uh, 200 billion, which is more than the double of what it, it was uh, before. And the question could be what people will do with their money after the <laughs> the pandemic. Um, so there, there is interesting uh, perspective. But this uh, pandemic is still uncertain because uh, on a medical ground, uh, and, and from my Red Cross experience, we know that an epidemic is usually two and a half years, three years on the health sector. And then economically, it's usually seven years recovery. So this is from previous epidemics in, and experience in other countries. So now we have a new element, which will be the vaccine's effect. So we will need at least 60% of the population vaccinated to make sure we have an impact on uh, a global impact on, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the crisis and on, on the COVID. So, uh, at this point, UN now have calculated that uh, the global economy has registered 10 trillion of losses uh, for this year, by the end of this year. So it is re really a huge impact. And some example, uh, because it increased the national debt in, in many countries, uh, USA, for example, 27 trillion by October, uh, 2020. So that is not too worry because US is a strong economy and there is some trust. So there is always someone interesting to buy the debts of strong countries like that. We had seen a few years ago with Greece that there were much less uh, people interested to buy the debt of Greece. So trust and, and confidence in, in a country is very important. So we can also hear um, the question is public debt, debt justify? Uh, is it moral to go so far? And some people could be a bit frightened by the level of the figures, but we realize that all countries have done it. And in a way there is no, no other option at this stage. Government can cover the needs until when? So definitely that also is, um, is a question, but again, there is not so much uh, choices. And looking at France GDP, it moved from 100% to 120% in one year. So that is, is showing how uh, the extent is, is important. The economic activity has dropped sharply. Here I have two charts about the industry activity. So we can see how it, it really 
um, went down uh, um, sharply. And same for employment rate. So we we have here in terms of percentage some example. I find interesting this comment from Kristalina Georgieva, the IMF general director. And she said, with the crisis still spreading, the outlook is worse than our already pessimistic projection. Without medical solution on a global scale for many economies, a more adverse development is likely. So this is really also what UN is saying and what we know now. I just take also the Africa case, and maybe this is my special attachment to the continent and to, to follow what's going on. We know that many countries in Africa have a huge debt. Uh, and uh, the, here, for example, they use five times the health budget just to repay the debt. And sometimes it's only repaying the interest of the debt, not even the debt itself. And there has been uh, a lot of discussion uh, between African and uh, multilateral organization to try to see how we could have a debt relief from, uh, for example, World Bank, IMF. So in, in 1990, also um, in the Paris Club coalition, there were negotiations if we could forgive the debt. So already from that time, there were discussion and um, that didn't um, uh, work out, which means that forgiveness as such was not approved. However, other mechanism can be put in place like pausing, pausing the repayment of the debt um, uh, or rescheduling government debt. So this is usually the measure which are, take, which are taken, but very often the country remain with huge debt. So there is also a big push for debt cancellation uh, and some countries said I will stop reimbursing, but this kind of system also um, kind of write off uh, is not what what uh, the system can can allow. Looking at what China has invested in Africa, for example, we talk about 143 billion in in seven years, and. Um, uh, it means that the relationship between China and many African countries are really tied up. And we see that Africa is a, uh, an area where um, global politics are also happening because to a certain extent, Europeans, Americans have forgotten a bit Africa. Then China came in. Uh, Russia or other Eastern Asian countries. So the future of Africa, it will be interesting to see how, how this can, can continue and what will be the effect in terms of um, uh, geopolitic relations. So also the discussion about posing the debt, forgiving the debts, all that discussion are also raised by the civil society. But um, that then the, that's not going that direction. So looking back again on this uh, response, economical response to this crisis as the example of the COVID, uh, the IMF response here has got a lot of requests of support. So emergency assistance, emergency facility, uh, debt relief, uh, credit facilities, creating more money. So we can see here there are some examples of what IMF has been faced this year. Same for World Bank and regional bank like uh, Asian Development Bank, Africa Development Bank. So uh, they put fast track facility in place. They are helping specific countries and uh, really also uh, supporting the private sector. Um, or to have a moratorium on, on debt payments. So that is what the big institution have put in place. I took another example of something which uh, is more from macro level to micro level is what uh, the example of university student case, because many students are taking a loan for doing their studies. 
And in fact, some of them are really having difficulty to repay their loan and are living on the, on the permanent debt. Um, so we have seen that the repayment of the debt for students is very tricky and uh, some take over 20 years to repay and even more. Additionally, what the COVID has created on, on the case of the student is that um, they, they cannot find small job to accompany their studies and then they need additional support from the family or now what we have seen social support uh, from food bank and social welfare service. So I can see that even in Paris now there are really a food bank for students to help them survive. Here, debt forgiveness, I have also captured some um, uh, uh, quote from, from uh, people, but what they say is that more or less, no, we cannot forgive a debt. It is a risk. We cannot even at the Europe level, uh, it's not possible because it would mean accepting Euro. So the solution um, to the debt is time grows mastering public spending, for example. So how we can uh, pay, reimburse the debt over a long period. So even you see Austria has planned 100 years to repay the debt, Germany 20 years. And the growth as, as uh, something that we as a Baha'i, we know we cannot continue to have a growth which is uh, perpetual. And we talk about new uh, concepts like circular economy, but definitely we have to rethink the lifestyle of people and what we use from, the, uh, from our planet. And then on the public spending, um, there are existing technical uh, infrastructure and system to refinance debts, to renegotiate. So there the public spending would have to, to, to develop. I put few Baha'i perspective and principles that um, uh, you can see. Uh, the idea of a single currency solu solution that would eliminate speculation and stability, um, uncertainty, and bring more economic justice. So that is a, a, a Baha'i dream that maybe will, will happen one day. Poverty eradication, a consensus of moral views in, in finance. Um, and some principle like universal basic income, universal employment, work of service to society, in graduated income task, uh, sharing voluntarily wealth, uh, and changing the lifestyle. So I have few quotations here um, from from Shogi Effendi, um, where it is clearly said that. Um, uh, uniform and universal system of currency is one of the number of common complementary measures to help simplify and facilitate intercourse and understanding among the nation and race of mankind. Um, there are several quotes here about remittance debt, about spiritual health, sacred priority, settlement of debt. So I will be able to share the presentation and people will have more time. Uh, same that the fact that we in the Baha'i, uh, they said we have to pay our debt. And um, even before going to pilgrimage, even before we are uh, somebody, when somebody passed away, we have to pay everything, including funeral, before giving to the to the cause. So uh, also, what Shoghi Effendi was saying that um, the intergovernmental debts have imposed a severe strain on the masses of people in Europe, have upset the equilibrium of national budget, have crippled national industry, have led to increase in the number of the unemployed, is no less apparent to an unprejudiced observer. So when we see what uh, the the, the quotes in, in the face have uh, uh, brought up uh, sometime from the beginning of the last century. It's quite amazing this uh, view on, uh, on, on, the, on the economy from the Baha'i point of view. That's it.
Thank you. Yes, Francois, you mentioned something really quite interesting that the Red Cross um, says uh, when it's come, that there's two years for an epidemic and then seven years of recovery after the epidemic. Um, so does is, is there a feeling at the Red Cross that this is going to directly affect the world, that, that, that we're, we're, at, we're actually about a year into the pandemic and it does look as if it's going to be another year before we get to the end of the pande pandemic, but that then would indicate that there's going to be another seven years of recovery. Is that the feeling of the Red Cross that that's, it's, it's going to directly translate that way. Yeah, we we are preparing now. We have launched an emergency appeal to help uh, nearly 140 countries in the world, and what we we that is really uh, on the health and um, uh, social sector, food uh, support, uh, so really basic survival uh, operations. But we know that the impact in long term the the uh, especially on the health sector, the hospital, the education system. There are countries where children have not been to school for over a year at all. So what that will will mean for the future? Um, and, and, and at some point, if I take uh, the example in India, when they decided to con confine people, but people had absolutely no resources even to eat the daily bread because they were living in an informal economy, little business in the streets and so on. And suddenly they have to be confined. So some people say, but should we die of hunger or die of COVID? At the end, we will die. And uh, you see, uh, the way to confine what we are doing is nearly a luxury when we can do it and have the state to to, to continue pay salary or to help the population to survive. It's not the same in all countries, even if there, there, there has been a lot of effort everywhere. And this is why some, some country in the South have not confined and uh, are trying to explain people uh, how to protect themselves, but even accessing masks is, is not possible. And, and, and the battle for vaccine that we are observing now, it's absolutely unbelievable because uh, really the country are fighting for, uh, from each other to access the vaccine. And unless we would have this COVAX program, which is a United Nations program to provide a vaccine to all uh, country equally and, and help the South to have access to, to vaccine, it's, uh, it's ridiculous the number of vaccine available so far. So they will come after the North when the North will have a good level of of coverage of vaccination, maybe they will share with the South. But I think we have seen quite a dirty uh, negotiation uh, around accessing the vaccine uh, vaccines now. On to Bill. Um, I've had the pleasure of hearing Bill speak on a number of subjects. Um, he goes 19 to the dozen, so keep your ears open. Um, I've never known anybody who's such a good student as uh, Mr. Jenkins. Um, he gets himself into all sorts of subjects. For us tonight, he's got a very intense uh, subject, but I should mention that Bill has been in the community, uh, the Baha'i community for nearly 30 years, I think 27 years, he said. Um, he's been a, a house husband, self-described for a decade or more, but that's really masked his true passion, which is to study economics. Why does he do that? Because he got really fed up with his previous career when he worked in an anti-poverty program for the esteemed Welsh government. And as he put it in his own words, I can't beat it. He quit in disgust because they wouldn't listen to the, the sense that needed to be uh, brought to the subject matter. Uh, as with Francois, I did ask Bill for something that we might be surprised about him. I'm not surprised by this because I know his passion, um, but he, he claims to have walked 79 peaks, say hills and mountains, I guess, around his home valleys uh, in the south of Wales, which is quite a feat. Um, and uh, the other one I loved was that his uh, best friend at school turned out in later life to be the head of music at YouTube. You never know these connections we all have. That might be useful one day. Bill, the floor is yours. So I've actually written a paper which can be circulated after the meeting in the coming week. Um, and this 
So the presentation isn't really a summary even, it's more a taster. It's just like to give you a sense of this is what's in the paper and then people are interested. I'm kind of thinking no one would have read the paper if it was sent out without the presentation. People might read it once they see, get a sense of what's in it. Um, the paper describes the pre-policy consensus regarding the financial system and the new understanding that has emerged since the 2008 crisis, drawing on a large body of empirical research since then. This new understanding presents policymakers and central banks with seemingly intractable and insurmountable challenges. The paper considers how principles of Baha'u'llah's revelation cast light upon these challenges, specifically with respect to the need for international cooperation, the need for a process of ongoing learning for the uh, development of institutions and the destabilizing effect of extreme concentrations of wealth and it's packed full of detail and references it's about i think 66 economic references on top of the baha'i references because i wanted to demonstrate it wasn't this isn't just like one economist pet idea this is a broad ranging research um so first of all on the pre-crisis consensus this, so this is really built, really comes to head at the turn of the century and continues until the crisis. And it's simply a manifestation of free market fundamentalism. It was believed that if there is free movement of capital, freely floating exchange rates, financial regulation only of institutions, but not of markets. So you set capital, capital adequacy ratios for banks to make sure they're sound, but you don't try and predict a, a financial bubble, for example, and calm markets down. Um, so those OC things enforce monetary policy controlled by independent central banks, free of government interfer interference, focused solely on inflation, not focused on growth, not focused on markets for government debt, for example. If you have all of this, then the monetary and financial system would take care of itself. And then the whole system exploded in 2008. So what have we learned since? Right, the next bit is really summarized. The detail is in the paper. The most important thing to understand is that the international financial system is a US dollar system. In the literature, this is referred to as global currency paradigm or US dollar hegemony or hegemony for our American friends. The US dollar is a dominant currency of international trade, of international funding, which means borrowing and lending, and is the reserve currency and currency of safe ass assets. In fact, when people want to refer to the international nature of the US dollar, you'll often hear them refer to it as a reserve currency. But this has a very specific meaning, the currency in which central banks hold their foreign exchange reserves. This term obscures an understanding of the other uses which are actually more significant. More than 50% of international trade not involving the US is nonetheless invoiced in US dollars. As a result, there is a tendency for firms producing for export to borrow in dollars so that the currency of their income matches the currency of their debts. As a result, you can always find someone who needs dollars. So US dollars are a safe way to store value. This creates an enormous demand for safe dollar assets, specifically US government debt, not just from central banks, but also from the giant multinational conglomerates and the asset manager complex who need to keep trillions of dollars in a liquid form. The impact of these extreme holdings of wealth and financial stability is explored further in my paper and I wasn't going to talk about it tonight, but then yesterday my son shared this meme on Facebook and it was just too perfect. Um, in December, so just to give you a flavor, in December 2016, 150 US companies held $1 trillion offshore in liquid assets, not in productive investment, this is just in liquid assets. More than half, 600 billion, was held by the richest 10 companies and Apple alone held $200 billion. The demand for safe assets flooding from these extreme concentrations of wealth actually destabilizes the financial system. And this is discussed further in the paper and that's a link to the Baha'i principle of abol abolition of extremes of wealth and poverty. But coming back to the, oh, I've got something resting on my keyboard. <laughs> coming back to the international usage of the dollar, this all creates a reinforcing system such that now that the US dollar is the international currency, it would take a cataclysmic shock to unseat it. The 2008 crisis and the COVID crisis actually entrenched its position as people rushed to safety by buying US dollar assets. Empirical research demonstrates that what we now have is a global financial cycle. Now, all the references and a fuller description of this are in the paper. The most impo important paper in this subject was by Hélène Ray in 2015. Mm. She analyzed data from 1990 to 2012 for 53 countries and found that a comprehensive set of indicators is driven by a single global factor, 
Subsequent papers suggest that this factor is US monetary policy. So US, the US dollar is the international currency and US domestic monetary, poly beca monetary policy becomes global monetary policy, making domestic monetary policy of other nations ineffective. These are known as monetary policy spillovers and are widely discussed in the literature. This particularly operates through the use of the dollar as a currency of funding, a dynamic, a dynamic that it is critical to understand. As a result, emerging market economies in particular have to use capital controls, foreign exchange intervention and macro prudential regulation to protect themselves from international flows of US dollars. And this is now the accepted policy of the IMF. The pre-crisis consensus has fundamentally changed. Free market fundamental, fundamentalism was wrong, the state has to intervene in financial markets. But I just want to pause here to ask you to reflect on the implications of these results. The global economy is now so interconnected that individual countries cannot successfully implement their own economic policies. The correlation with Baha'i teachings is obvious. Um, but while the policy consensus has changed in the three areas mentioned, it has not changed adequately around monetary policy. Now that we can see we have a global system in which the monetary policy of major currencies becomes the global monetary policy, robbing other countries of their monetary sovereignty, how should we respond? The literature is clear on the need for cooperation, but pessimistic on the possibility of achieving this. There are lots of quotations in my paper, but here are just three. Um, Hélène Ray concludes, if history is of any guidance, putting in place an effective international cooperation among the main central banks um, seems out of reach. Another seminal paper by two economists at the Bank for International Settlement states, this of course is a perennial challenge of international cooperation, one that has proved so intractable over the years. This would highlight that no individual country can be safe unless the world as a whole is safe. And finally, this somber warning, Based on this analysis, how far away is the international community from finding adequate solutions? The answer is still a long way. My paper considers this need for cooperation and the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation. After all, al Baha said, the supreme need of humanity is cooperation and reciprocity. And it should therefore be of great interest and encouragement to Baha'is to discover that the conclusion of those economists who have actually studied empirically the dynamics of the financial system is that there is unequivocally a need for international cooperation in its functioning. But it's not, not enough merely to acknowledge that cooperation is good. This adds nothing to the, debate, to the debate. In my paper, I follow the example of the Universal House of Justice in using Baha'u'llah's analogy in his tablet to Queen Victoria of the world as a, hum, as a human body. There's no time for any detail, but to draw out the key point, consider this statement by Claudio Borio. Rather, it calls for an understanding that unadjusted policies result in spillover effects that sooner or later will come back to haunt individual economies like a boomerang. They're saying US monetary policy destables the world and that comes back and bounces back onto the US. What it calls for therefore is enlightened self-interest. The financial system needs to be viewed as a single global system that can only function in the interests of the world when all its constituent actors are focused on the health and stability of the system as a whole not on their own individual advantage. The existence of a global financial cycle clearly indicates the need for the relevant institutions to take a global view. And this is more than enlightened self-interest. International cooperation should not merely be a process in which governments pursue their national self-interest through mutually beneficial agreements with other nations. As Abdul Baha states in The Secret of Divine Civilization, the secret attribute of perfection is justice and impartiality. This means to have no regard for one's own personal benefits and selfish advantages. For Baha'i, all this empirical evidence of a global financial cycle and the need for global coordination obviously points to the need for a global central bank, because we know that the future world order entails global institutions, and in the words of the Guardian, entails a universal and uniform system of currency. But there's no point recommending this because it's just too far beyond people's capacity, capacity to even conceive especially in these days when the false god of nationalism is again in the ascendancy. To highlight one example, here is Borio again from the Bank for International Settlements, talking about whether the IMS special drawing rights could replace domestic currencies like the dollar, euro and yen as the international currency. 
He says, short of creating a supranatural central bank that operated in SDRs, this would require an explicit link to monetary policies. In other words, you don't get away from the dominance of those national monetary policies by using SDRs unless you create a global central bank because the SDR is just a basket of those currencies. Well, fine, so we create a global central bank then. No, what borrow means is that SDRs cannot fulfill the role of a global currency because this re require the creation of a supranational central bank and that's not going to happen. The impossibility of this is so obvious that he doesn't even make this point explicitly. That's what we're up against. That's how far the world needs to travel. Now, reading all these papers I've been studying, it feels like the authors can't articulate recommendations because the obvious solutions are so antithetical to their training as economists. And the point is, as Baha'is, we should not be concerned with offering solutions. We should be inviting others to join us in processes of learning. We should seek to enter into discourse with others, to use the language of the House of Justice, with the purpose of finding consensus, not of convincing them of the rightness of ideas. You know, consultation isn't when you try and convince someone else that you're right, it's this dialogue to achieve consensus. And remarkably, we can actually point to the history of central banking for an example of just such a process of learning. In 1866, the London Wholesale Bank over in Gurney and Company collapsed, triggering a financial crisis. The Bank of England, then a private institution, did not believe it was its role to offer emergency loans to other institutions. After some time, the pressures of the crisis forced them to start making such loans, but they continued to deny that this was their role, or even that they were doing it. They like, denied they were even making these loans. In the end, the pressure of circumstance forced this role to become explicit. In response, the editor of The Economist magazine, Walter Badgett, wrote his classic book, Lombard Street. In it, he chastises the Bank of England. He makes clear that not only was it their old role to act as the lender of last resort, but that needs to be known by all actors in the market that they will do so. This knowledge will calm markets and restore confidence such that institutions will begin lending to each other again. This is the lender of last resort role that is universally accepted as the role of central banks in the crisis and is known as Badgett's rule. The British central bank learned that it needed to play this role and this lesson has spread globally. After the 2008 crash, the Federal Reserve played an analogous role for the global monetary system. Rather than lending, it bought distressed assets of the market and a role termed market maker of last resort. Again, more details in my paper. However, like the Bank of England in 1866, it took the Fed several months and the collapse of Lehman Brothers to understand that it needed to take this action to backstop the global system. They then quickly developed a series of policy tool tools to restore calm to international markets. They have now clearly learned their lesson as at the beginning of the COVID crisis, they immediately took strong and decisive action using the same tools they developed in 2008. Here is a clear process of institutional learning with respect to the financial system. At the national level, we have learned certain lessons regarding the role of institutions in a national monetary system. We now need to learn the same lessons at the international level. The problem is the international role of the Fed, I've just described, is not widely understood outside of central banking and financial economist circles, a very small group. What many mainstream economists think they know about the monetary and financial system, learnt mainly from the textbooks, isn't really correct, a point central bankers have often made and the references are in the paper. The current situation with the international monetary and financial system is not unlike climate change 20 years ago. The scientific evidence of there is there of what direction we need to go in, but that science is ideologically inconvenient. The contribution of Baha'is, I suggest, is not to point to the supposed solutions, but to encourage a process of learning based on the science. And there's loads of detail in the paper for people who want to know more. Um, I'm just saying uh, thank you very much, Bill, as ever, packed with information. I'm sure the references will be very valuable. A couple of people have already asked for assurances that they will see the paper and enjoy the presentation as well. Um, there is actually a, a question directly uh, for you, Bill, so draw breath. It's a straightforward question, Bill. What's your prediction for the next 10 years? In writing the paper, I came up with this analogy with climate change. The threat of future crises within the monetary system is not unlike the crisis of climate change. The actions of a relatively small number of agents has a tremendous destabilizing impact upon the system. The impact is cumulative and operates through feedback loops that build up over time. As a result, the process of cause and effect is not immediately ob obvious and those who most urgently need to change their behavior can deny that such processes are happening at all. 
Meanwhile, the devastating impact of this instability will affect every member of the human race, while those who are primarily responsible have the resources to shield themselves from its worst effects. Those economists who have studied this system have therefore performed a great service for the human race. And I think that the, the international monetary financial system is kind of like the climate, and some of these derivatives you hear about are like the uh, greenhouse gases being pumped into the atmosphere. And I think it is very unstable, and I think it, it could collapse, but the, the, the 2008 crisis and the COVID crisis hasn't been enough. And I think it would be foolhardy to make predictions along this line. But I do note the recent message from the House of Justice, that I'm talking about the one-year plan and then the nine-year plan, saying that humanity has realized that this is just probably the first of a series of crises. So I would happily put money on there's going to be, a, there is, well, there's undoubtedly going to be another financial crisis in the next 10 years. It's probably going to be two or three in the next um, 10 years. The question is how cataclysmic they're going to be. But you see, unseating the dollar as an international currency is, is not in anyone's interest. It's extremely difficult because everyone's sitting on dollar assets they're just gonna want sitting on these assets. And it's, it's really a wonderful opportunity to tease out this need for an understanding of a global system that requires global institutions. Can I ask Ian, uh, who way back asked a question um, about interest and, and how that is now in this new dispensation regarded as a, as a legitimate charge. Ian, do you wanna develop your question and pose it first to Francoise and then to Bill? Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, the question was really, about Baha'u'llah's statement that um, interest on money is in this dispensation regarded as, you know, a legitimate business transaction like any other business transaction. And so how does this impinge on our understanding of the morality of debt? You know, because in the past usury was considered to be a sin so I know it's an incredibly general question, but I just wondered if anyone had had any thoughts on that. May I link that to another question which Richard posed, which is, are there any examples where a poor country has been disabled from doing something it wants to do because of its debt burden? These kind of feel like they fit together. Bill, are you able to pick up either of those? Yeah, well, I will be able to share uh, some quotes where it says that... Uh, uh, yes, if we if we can charge interest on loan, and it is uh, it is lawful and proper to charge interest on money, and it should be treated like any business uh, transaction. So this is uh, from a tablet of Baha'u'llah, and that therefore it said. Uh, uh, we have prescribed that interest on money should be treated like other business transaction and that uh, uh, this is a lucid command, uh, commandment. Yes, it is uh, recommended as a proper uh, business, okay. but it should be at a reasonable rate also. And Francoise, you're probably best placed between yourself and Bill to comment on whether you're aware from the Red Cross perspective, whether there have been any poor countries who've been disabled from doing something they really want to do simply because of their debt burden or as a contributing factor. Yes, we have plenty of countries and some uh, like uh, one which uh, there are several affected in Africa. We have seen uh, uh, the Ebola crisis, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, uh, regions were really uh, uh, affected and uh, for, for quite long time, and then they were not able to work, to develop, to pay, and so indeed it is uh, affected. And the debt is preventing especially education and health. So this is uh, the two things. Unfortunately, you see some countries have, having still a defense budget very high, usually connecting with uh, high corruption as well. Maybe a supplementary to that is actually, Francois, drawn from your own presentation. You had a figure, I think it was $140 billion is owed by African countries to China. Um, that feels like a kind of, kind of debt imperialism. I think that they can be linked to um, what Bill was talking about, this, um, the, the investment of China in Africa, is that China has, has stated quite clearly that it wants to move away from reliance on the dollar 
and therefore is trying to use its um, liquidity to purchase assets. So much of the investment of China in Africa is to purchase raw materials and resources that it can then that that it can then use for its own in industry, so that it's not as reliant on the dollar. So the, the two problems of debt and of um, reliance on the dollar are, in, in this respect, um, connected. You know, if, if Ian wants to borrow money for a business and I lend him money, there need, needs to be that incentive for me to um, part with my liquidity, you know, and so you know, to take that risk. Um, and Bahá'u'llá says that it should be set uh, at reasonable levels, but it's up to the House of Justice in the future to determine what this is. So it's one of these places where I would infer from this, it's the role of the state to intervene in the management of the economy and of the financial, financial economy. It's the House of Justice will determine what these appropriate levels of debt are. Um, at the level of government debt, then there's so much to say about it. I don't know if I can even begin. I don't know if anyone's come across modern monetary theory or MMT. It gets, it's actually getting into the news. Now the MMTers are a bit annoying, but they're mostly right. Like most, if you, most of what they're saying is correct. So if you hear it, go, yeah, yeah, they're actually right. In terms of the accounting of money, what they're saying is correct, but they're not the first people to say it. <laughs> I've, I know a really good economist who says the trouble with MMT is what they're correct about is not original and what is original is not correct. It's a bit harsh, but he has got a point. So, you know, you can look into, into that. So the, all the US debt is in dollars and the Federal Reserve can just create dollars. The US can't go bankrupt very similar with the Bank of England. Um, the problem was in countries borrow in a different currency. And of course you have to borrow in dollars to participate in the international economy. And so America has this exorbitant privilege, um, which is just, I'm not gonna go into, into, into it, it's discussed in the paper. Although it has far greater debts than assets, and people say how it, greater liabilities than assets, and people think this isn't sustainable, it makes more interest or gets a greater yield on its overseas liabilities than it's paying out on the debt that it's selling. So it actually makes a profit just on the spread between its assets and liabilities. When we think about government debt, actually governments start the monetary system going. Governments just create money and spend it into the economy. And that, that's the way it needs to be. And then you can see taxes are drained, draining it out to, present, to prevent uh, inflation. That's the MMT way of looking at it. A really interesting take is by a group of World Bank economists led by Biagio Bassone from Italy. They did a 2018 paper saying that when you correctly, government created money isn't equity, isn't debt, it's equity, and it should be accounted as equity. Money printed by the government are share certificates because this, you know, it's how it's your share of the productivity in society. In terms of the repayability of debt. The backing of government debt is the productivity of the economy and the infrastructure to be able to tax that economy. Now, some countries, I remember talking to Stephen about his charity, Malawi. Malawi just, you know, the, the villages he works with, they don't pay tax. They don't have this system and tax is a good thing. Tax gives you this fiscal base that gives your monetary policy stability. So the real question is, is the productivity of the economy. And if governments create money and spend it into the economy in ways that increase productivity, it's always sustainable. That in itself isn't a problem. But I'll shut up about government debt now. I've heard of Pilgrim's Notes from Shoghi Effendi that the dollar would become worthless. And that would seem to imply that uh, we're, we're, at some point we're going to have a major you know, global fi financial crisis uh, and therefore maybe the whole trading system breaking down if the currency which everybody is trading you know, becomes worthless. Of course, I've always hoped that, that might be the thing that would save us from climate change. Because if we can stop trading in fossil fuels, we might actually <laughs> change the economy in time to avoid even worse crises down the road. But uh, the economists and you have any comments on on what that that Pilgrim's note might suggest about where we're going? I'll just say very briefly. Yeah, I think we probably do have to go through serious crisis and collapse of the global trading system. Um, someone said, you know, what am I, what do I think is going to happen in the next ten years? And I don't want to make a prediction, but I think. Yeah, that's kind of likely the next 10 years. That's, you know, don't want to be too negative. That's the way life life is. Um, what I think is really interesting, and in Britain, we've got this awful thing called Brexit going on, is this sense of what we have is global supply chains. And most economic theories just have these simple models of producers and consumers. 
But when you have global supply chains going through countries, um, all trading with each other in the dollar, you've got this incredibly interconnected system. And so if it collapses, there is no food in your local supermarket. You know, the system is so complicated. We've lost the capacity in the, in the advanced economies to actually feed ourselves simply. You know, Africa will be all right. We'll be screwed in America and Europe. And quite frankly, good for Africa. We deserve what we've got coming to us. Maybe also I can add that um, there were many comments at the beginning of the COVID to say uh, why it is in the north, why Africa is not affected, because there were a lot of uh, alarms saying that Africa will be really it will be a disaster because it's 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 uh, more difficult. But indeed, the, the the epidemic is there, but not at the same. Uh, rate that what we see in, in, in the north, in China, in, in, in the States, in Brazil. So we, we can also really appreciate that see with a global chain huh, of resources, uh, people will have to come back to uh, local food production. And we have seen that suddenly, even in the production of masks, suddenly we saw there were one single producer, uh, producer of masks in China. And then the whole world was waiting and uh, for, for that. So it has opened the eyes uh, that uh, countries need a minimum of independency in basic production of food and some uh, important material. And at least this COVID crisis has highlighted that. I think that every time we have a crisis, we learn something, but we easily forget the learning. And when we have the stress and the previous epidemics, we learn a lot on, on for example, uh, how to do when you travel. And, and there were a lot of equipment given in airport all over the world and so on. So that learning was used for this crisis and we have seen that Europe, America are much less prepared to crisis than in Asia. This is why Asia, they, they, many, many countries were less affected immediately because they had mechanism from previous epidemics that were in place and they have learned the confinement, the protection and so on. So this is now what the, the Europe and America is learning uh, painfully that we, we have in place system which are very fragile and that we have seen also corruption in many states. Why we don't have masks in France was more or less negligence, corruption and incompetencies of, of uh, people responsible. So it's a painful eye opener for many governments. I'll just make a couple of quick comments. First, uh, Bill, it was great. Thanks for uh, that a lot. And I definitely look forward to reading your paper. But, you know, I think the the, the work that uh, I did, the work that we did with together with Francoise, I mean, basically, uh, I agree that this is this is about uh, discourse. It's really about discourse. We need to think about what is going on, because I often say it's it's like bizarre if you really look at the details of what's going on in the financial sector today. And is there a bubble? Is it going to burst? I think before 2008, you know, the same thing, like most people just kind of played like everything was going to go on and only one or two people said, no, the bubble's going to burst. And guess what? The bubble burst. And, and are we at the same point now? I think what is obvious to, to me anyway, I don't know about others, is that it is something is going in a very bad direction. Even we see there are studies done by a Dutch group that shows that this kind of what's going on today with the central banks and with others is increasing the, the, um, the inequalities in the world. It's contributing to the wide uh, between the 1% and the 99%. It's, it's, it's impacting everything, right? And going in the really quite a wrong direction in many ways, not to mention all of the, all of the dirty stuff that's going on. In, in the world, you know, outside of government, you know, without a government giving Arthur and his friend and, and my and, and everybody else working on, you know, international issues and international risk, you know, uh, uh, governance, it, it's, it's right here in front of our face, like climate change. Okay, forget about it. Never mind. Okay, never mind. You're going to blow up because of the climate change. We're going to blow up because of the monetary situation. It is going to happen. So I often talk about, I often joke. So what do we do? We, we wait for the sky to fall, you know, and then we figure out what to do afterwards. Or do we start to do something now, like 
develop local communities, develop their even systems by which you can develop monetary systems within a group, within a core group. You can go to outside of the banks too big to fail. You can start working with cooperative banks where everybody works for everybody in the cooperative. You know, there's lots of different ways we can get around this, but I certainly don't think we should sit around and wait for the sky to fall, personally. Would Francoise or Bill like to respond? Yeah, and I think that definitely in discussion um, with a working group at the House of Justice about uh, how, how we should react to disasters as a community, the Baha'i community. And what came out in, in that consultation is that the, the solution is with local communities. Because when the global system uh, dysfunction, uh, people will have to to work with what they have at hand in their local community. And we have seen when we had natural disasters like in Vanuatu cyclone, they immediately were quick to go back on, on, their, on their feet. So it is for us a little bit the same. When you have a disaster, first the local community will bring the, the first relief and then will have the resilience to go back into business and, and operations. Uh, there, has been, there have been studies made about how long it takes for uh, people to recover from a natural disaster when you have a earthquake or floods and things like that. And what happened is that immediately the small and medium enterprise are the one who are the most agile to, to restart the business and to bring people into action and work and helping each other and, and so on. But when you have such big magnitude, big disaster, high magnitude like we have now, of course you need a global solution also and, 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 and response, but it will, in the future, we will have more, more disaster, more natural disasters because of climate change, but also what we are preparing at global level in Red Cross, we will have more migrants and that is, is clear. We are talking between 200, 300 million migrants leaving uh, their country and coming all over. And we will have um, a lot of violence. So we, we think that when people will have to fight to survive, that would create violence. So we have to, to be prepared for, for, for that. I, I agree with Francois. I actually agree with Gary as well. I think, you know, I agree with your analysis of the economic situation and how we might that might make us respond to that emotionally and I think in terms of what we do it, it's all a bit forlorn I mean I, I used to be a manager in a government anti-poverty program and it wasn't like that they wouldn't implement ideas they wouldn't listen to the questions I was going like nothing works nothing we do works nothing we do makes any difference and I would like create spaces for my staff to do meaningful work in communities by shielding to from the management nonsense that came down that from the top management chain and when i left they all said they never understood how much they were shielding them from because the new they i left they brought in a yes man and there was this flood of like follow the policy follow the policy and you know you get paid the same for following the policy it's much easier but it doesn't achieve anything so i couldn't bear being in this situation and i just had questions about the flow of money, poverty has to go out the flow of money. I asked economist friend, what's some good monetary economics to read? Um, and it just kind of started a journey, which is like my hill walking, 79 peaks, Steve, Steve mentioned it. I walk one mountain, I go, oh, that's a nice view. What's that mountain over there? And I look in the map and I go and walk it. And I read something in a comics paper and I see they're talking about something. I think, that's interesting. Who's, you know, who else has written about this? And so I search on topics. If I find a really good economist, I read through what they've read and I search the people criticizing them. And it's just like going from mountain to mountain. I've read a lot more than 79 economics papers, I have to say. Um, the, and because it's an interconnected system, you cannot understand the economy unless you understand the international monetary and finance system. You have to understand it to understand, to understand how economies function. And this knowledge is completely useless to a working class house husband from Swansea in an area, you know, <laughs> this big heroin hotspot that I live in in Swansea, trying to talk to my neighbours about community building. This is not of any use to me in one sense, it's just a hobby. Um, but I think, that, you know, and things do need to begin at the local level. This is what happens to the plan, but we need to have this vision of where the plan of the house is just as takes us. Within our clusters, we move past the first milestone, the second milestone. And, and probably we need to share more about this uh, economical situation and 
and uh, I, I was really impressed with the, the recent messages of the House of mm. Justice and how they, they prepare us for uh, this, uh, uh, well, let's say gloomy uh, situation in the future, but definitely it is something that uh, Baha'i uh, community, local, national level will have to work on that because that will affect everybody. I, I hope you're right, Francoise, because that means I haven't been wasting my time. <laughs> but I think it, when you get to the third milestone, what it means is you've developed levels of capacity within your cluster. You have large numbers of people involved and you're able to coordinate these efforts. And the house is very explicit. The third milestone is when you, you've multiplied the numbers of centers of intense activity and you start to develop social action. You, you're motivating people to address the challenges that they face, because what we need is knowledge and understanding. You know, at the moment, what the man in the street knows about the economy is next to nothing, and it's wrong. Economics textbooks, you know, basic undergraduate textbooks, are full of lots of ideas that are proven just to be wrong. The description of money creation in most economics textbooks is wrong. The description of monetary policy is wrong. You know, there's all these ideas that are very, very bogus. And, you know, and that's kind of a problem. And so in public debates, people hear a politician say thing, oh, how are we going to pay for this? The question isn't how do we pay for this? The question is how do we marshal the physical and human resources of society to meet our needs? And if free markets are failing to do that, then we need to not just rely on free markets. And what is the role of the state in these kind of things? But the minute you talk about the role of the state, people go, oh, that's just socialism. That's, that's just Russia, as if there's only two options extreme free market capitalism or command economies. You know, there's no one in the world who thinks command economies are a bad idea. Just because Soviet Russia failed doesn't mean there isn't a role for the state in the economy. There is, and there's masses of empirical research demonstrating this, um, but it don't find its way into the economic textbook.